This is Space Time, Series 27, Episode 7, for broadcast on the 15th of January, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, NASA delays a manned return to the lunar surface until 2026. A successful maiden flight for United launches new Vulcan Centaur rocket. And NASA's Parker Solar Probe completes its 18th close encounter with the Sun. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has scrubbed this year's planned Artemis II manned mission around the moon. The agency says the flight, the first to take humans to the moon in over 50 years, will be delayed until at least September next year. In the process, pushing the return of people to the lunar surface aboard the Artemis 3 mission back from December 2025 until at least September 2026. NASA's put the delays down to a range of safety concerns with the Lockheed Martin-built Orion spacecraft, as well as development issues with the new moon suits and continuing delays with SpaceX's Starship Mega Rocket, which will carry crews from the Orion spacecraft orbiting around the moon down to the lunar surface and back up again. The 25-day unmanned Artemis One mission to the moon back in November 2022 appeared to go smoothly, with no serious issues disclosed at the time. However, it's now been revealed that the Artemis I Orion capsule suffered more extensive charring damage to its ablative heat shield during atmospheric re-entry than was initially expected. And tests on another Orion spacecraft have now uncovered a design flaw with the life support system's electronics, as well as a separate issue which has popped up with one of the battery systems. There have also been two failed launch attempts from its Texas Starbase by SpaceX's 121-metre-tall Starship, which are posing serious concerns. Both launch failures saw the Starship Super Heavy explode in the skies over the Gulf of Mexico. A third test flight is now planned for next month. But the longer it takes to get Starship into Earth orbit, the longer NASA will have to wait before it can launch its Artemis III mission. And there are other complications with Starship as well. SpaceX points out that Starship will need to have its fuel tank refilled once it's in orbit around the Earth, before it heads off to the Moon. An estimated 10 fuel transfers will be needed to do the job, and so SpaceX are planning to build an orbital fuel depot. And there have also been ongoing issues with the manufacture of the new EVA spacesuits for use on the lunar surface, which are being developed by Houston's Axiom Space. The Apollo-era spacesuits, which were used during the late 60s and 70s and are still the basis for the EVA spacesuits used by NASA today, aren't really suitable for use on the lunar surface. That's because they become damaged by the ultra-fine but extremely sharp lunar dust or regolith, which, as the Apollo astronauts found out, became a real problem. Not only did the dust get everywhere on the suit, clogging equipment and causing radiators to overheat, but it was so sharp that it quite literally wore a hole in the knee on the outer spacesuit garment during one geological EVA. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson says the delays will give the Artemis teams more time to work through the challenges. The 10-day Artemis II mission, which includes three Americans and one Canadian astronaut, will be a full-scale dress rehearsal for Artemis III. It'll orbit the Earth twice in order to gain enough speed for translunar injection, taking humans further from the Earth than ever before into an extended lunar orbit that will result in a free return trajectory back to Earth. If successful, that'll be followed by the Artemis III mission, which will land astronauts on the moon's South Pole, which Nilsson describes as a different moon from the Sea of Tranquility, where Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed in 1969. The Sea of Tranquility was relatively flat terrain. The lunar South Pole, on the other hand, is pot-marked with deep craters, and because of the angle of the sunlight, most of those craters are in total darkness. NASA says the delay shouldn't affect the following Artemis IV mission, which will be the first to use the new Lunar Gateway Orbital Space Station. It currently remains on track for launch in 2028. During NASA's Apollo era, 12 Americans walked on the lunar surface, in the process winning the space race and demonstrating to Moscow that Washington held the ultimate Cold War high ground. 
Today, the competition isn't the Soviet Union, but rather China. We're expecting to have Taikonauts walking on the moon by 2030. This is space time. Still to come, the United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan Centaur rocket undertakes a successful maiden flight. And NASA's Parker Solar Probe completes its closest encounter so far with the sun. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan Centaur rocket has undertaken a highly successful maiden flight. The new 62-metre-tall two-stage Vulcan Centaur was initially designed to meet the desire to phase out the current Russian RD-180 engines used on the Atlas V, which are no longer being supported by Moscow following the Western boycott of Russia in response to the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine. It also provided the United Launch Alliance with an opportunity to replace the Heritage Delta IV rocket with a new single-launch system. The Vulcan's twin Blue Origin sourced BE-4 liquid methane and liquid oxygen powered core stage replaces the kerosene and liquid oxygen fueled RD-180s used on the Atlas V as well as the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen core stage engines used on the Delta IV. And the Vulcan core stage is designed to be fitted with up to six strap-on solid rocket boosters depending on payload and target orbit. On top of that, there's a new Centaur 5 upper stage. It replaces the earlier design Common Centaur and Centaur 3 variants, which were used on the Atlas V. The mission called CERT-1 blasted off from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida. Status check. Go Vulcan. Go Centaur. Go Parent. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3... We have ignition and liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket, launching a new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. Two good SRBs, hitting peak pressure on the SRBs. Everything looking good. Got pitching our programs in, coming into normal rates for that event. We have good hydraulic pressure on both engines, good chamber pressure on both engines. Everything looking good. Coming up on 60 seconds into the flight, everything looking good. Two good engines, two good SRBs. Body rates look good, nice and smooth. And we've hit our first throttle point on the BE-4s. So everything looking good. And we have passed through Mach 1. We are now supersonic, coming up on max Q. We've had max dynamic pressure. Everything looking good. We're rolling off on the SRBs. And we have cutoff on the SRBs, coming up on jettison in approximately 30 seconds. 15 seconds to SRB jet. BE-4s continue to operate nominal. Seeing expected PU activity on the boost remains. And we have separation of both SRBs. Everything looking good. BE-4s continue to operate normally. Coming up on two minutes into the mission, we are now 17 miles in altitude. We just heard confirmation of solid rocket booster jettison. We have about three minutes until we reach our next mission event, booster engine cutoff. And we see booster PU correcting towards a nominal MR. Everything looking good. Both engines continue to burn normally. And we now weigh approximately half of our liftoff weight. Everything looking good. And we fired the power valve, activating the reaction control system on the upper stage. Pressures are rising, as expected. PE-4 continues to operate normally. Vehicles continue to fly down the center of the range track. Everything looking good. 33 miles in altitude, 52 miles downrange, traveling at 4,000 miles per hour. Continue to see excellent performance out of the PE-4s. Chamber pressure nice and smooth. Vehicle steadily accelerating. A little over 2 Gs at this time. Good body rates. Nice and smooth operation of the booster. 47 miles in altitude, 95 miles downrange at 5,500 miles per hour. Engines continue to burn normally. Everything looking good. And the vehicle now weighs one quarter of its liftoff weight as we pass through the Carmen line. Next mark event we're looking for is boost base children on the Centaur main engines. Booster mains continue to operate normally. And we've begun boost phase chill. Housing temps are dropping as expected. Coming up to the end of boost phase, Approximately 10 seconds to BECO. Throttle down in preparation for BECO. We've completed boost phase chill down. And we have cutoff. Coming up on Vulcan Center separation. We have Vulcan Center separation. Everything looking good. Coming up on the Centaur phase. 
and experience a bit of data loss here. We've recovered the data. So it sent our engines are up and running normally, good steady state pressure, and we've just jettisoned the payload fairing. Two good brake wires, yeah. good steady state operating levels on the Centaur mains, two good engines, gone to open loop control on Centaur PU. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus five minutes, 57 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Rob Gannon confirm the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. Our next event, main engine cutoff, will occur in about 10 minutes. While we wait, I'm joined by Amanda Bichetti, ULA Director of Vehicle Upgrades. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's still early, but congratulations. Thank you, you as well, this is amazing. <laughs> How did it feel to watch the Vulcan rocket lift off for the first time? Oh, just absolutely amazing. I didn't expect it to be the way it was. It just, my heart is still pounding. It was excellent. And just, I'm so proud of all the work that the team did to get where we are today. Absolutely, and developing a new rocket is an enormous investment endeavor of which you were a huge part. Um, again, we're still early, but how do you imagine the whole Vulcan team is feeling right now? I, I feel like they have to be the same way, you know, smile ear to ear. I know the team is at all our sites, friends and family. They've been supporting us for many years to get to where we are. So I'm sure they are jumping up and down just like me. It's been amazing. How is the Vulcan rocket going to change the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. So Vulcan is very much based on our heritage rockets, the Delta IV and Atlas V vehicles, but we've brought in a lot of new innovation and capabilities that are gonna allow us to even better support our warfighters, exploration, as well as connecting the world. And the great thing about Vulcan is it's highly versatile, meaning we can use that vehicle to do anything we want, allows for affordability for anybody who needs access to space. This is the first certification flight. What are the next steps for Vulcan after this? Yeah, so with the, the first flight, we are well under the way from a certification perspective. We do have a second flight that we'll need to do here later this year. Once that complete, get completed, we'll have about two months or so of post-flight data testing. And then at that point, we will be certified um, by the, the U.S. Space Force, and we will be ready to fly all of their important payloads for them. Coming up on 500 seconds into the mission, everything's looking good. Continuing to burn Centaur. Body rates look right as expected. Steady acceleration, just under half a G. And we are now 235 miles in altitude, 836 miles downrange, traveling at 11,150 miles per hour. Continuously nominal performance from Centaur. And approaching the uh, halfway point of this first burn of Centaur, everything looks good. We're now 1,000 miles downrange, traveling at 11,500 miles per hour. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 10 minutes, 7 seconds. Our next event, main engine cutoff, will occur in about five minutes. While we wait, I'm joined by Eric Monda, part of ULA's mission design team. Eric, thanks for joining us. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're still pretty early in this flight today, but can you tell us how the data is looking so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to say that it was so exciting. I, I ran outside so I could watch this thing lift off, and that was so cool after so many years of development to, uh, to watch this thing fly. That was fantastic. Absolutely, I bet. Yeah. So um, what is the data showing us so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I've had a very quick look. Uh, obviously, we're very early in the flight still, uh, but I've taken a look at the SRB performance as well as the booster performance so far, and everything looks just spot on, just perfect. Um, you know, fortunately, we've had a lot of these systems on Atlas and Delta for a long time, and so we've had a lot of flight data to anchor our models, and everything is lining up just like we would expect. Can you talk a little bit about why we need three burns and how we use those three burns to complete our mission today? So the first burn performs our injection into low Earth orbit. Unfortunately, if we just continue that burn from that point in time, we wouldn't necessarily be aligned uh, with where we need to be in order to get to the moon. So what we do after we get to low Earth orbit is we shut those engines down, we coast around until we get to the right spot to do that, and then we light those engines up again. When we do that and complete that burn, that will allow us to uh, send the astrobotic um, peregrine lander uh, onto the moon. So we shut those down, engines down again, and we are, are ready to do that, and then start them up one more time in order to do the third burn. And that's what's gonna take Celestis's Enterprise mission out to deep space. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where these things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna go ahead and shut down the, um, the main engines uh, on the Centaur when we get about halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. And then we're gonna coast the rest of the way across the Atlantic Ocean, across Africa, and go ahead and start the engines up again when we get to Madagascar. And that's where we'll do the second burn. And then we coast again until we get um, about to Papua New Guinea. And when we get to about to over Papua New Guinea, that's where we'll go ahead and, and do that third and final burn. The second burn will be about four minutes long. 
and then we'll have another coast for 30 minutes before we have a pretty short, like 20 second burn uh, for the final burn. Uh, once we've done that, then we've got some uh, engineering demos we're gonna do before we finally safe the stage and shut everything off. And then and about four days later is when uh, the Centaur will leave the Earth-Moon system and be off on its way to deep space. Depending on its configuration, the new Vulcan Centaur launcher can carry a payload of up to 27.2 tons into low Earth orbit, 15.3 tons into geostationary orbit, and 12.1 tons into lunar transfer orbit, making it comparable with SpaceX's Falcon 9. Aboard the Vulcan's maiden flight was Astrobotics' Peregrine Lunar Lander. Its mission, however, wasn't nearly as successful as the Vulcan's. The robotic lander separated from the central upper stage without incident, and its avionic systems powered up and performed nominally, sending telemetry back to Astrobotics mission managers through NASA's Deep Space Network. However, just hours later, Astrobotics began reporting technical problems, starting with what appeared to be an inability to orient Peregrine's top-mounted solar panels towards the sun. That's needed to keep the lunar lander's onboard batteries charged up. Peregrine then began to drift off course and communications were temporarily lost. Eventually, engineers were able to re-establish contact with the 1,283-kilogram lander and were able to send instructions to keep it tilted in the right direction to keep its solar array pointing towards the sun. As mission managers try to work out what was going wrong, they eventually traced the problem to a faulty valve in part of the spacecraft's propulsion system. An image taken by one of the onboard cameras showed the multi-layer insulation badly displaced and damaged that explains some of the telemetry, which was showing a critical loss of propellant on board the spacecraft. In fact, judging by the loss rate, Peregrine was destined to run out of fuel within 40 hours. That loss of propellant meant the mission was doomed to fail, with a soft landing on the moon now out of the question. The only good news was that experiments on board the lander were performing well and they were sending back good data. Astrobotics were now simply committed to getting the Peregrine as close to the moon as possible before it loses its ability to maintain a sun-pointing position and subsequently loses all power and enters an uncontrollable tumble. Peregrine was supposed to enter lunar orbit and remain there for several weeks before committing to a landing in the mid-latitude region of the moon at a place called Sirius Viscositatis on February the 23rd. This is space time. Still to come... NASA's Parker Solar Probe completes its closest encounter with the Sun. And later in the science report, meteorologists have now confirmed that 2023 was the hottest year ever recorded on planet Earth. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Parker Solar Probe has just undertaken its 18th close approach to the Sun, skimming just 7.26 million kilometres above the visible solar surface. The close encounter, known as Perihelion, began on Christmas Eve and continued until January the 2nd, with the spacecraft swooping down at some 635,266 kilometres per hour. The close approach distance matched the record set by Parker during its previous close encounter back in September last year. It also matched the speed record set during that encounter. Mission managers at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland's report that the spacecraft entered its close encounter with the Sun in good health, with all systems operating nominally. Following close approach, the Parker Solar Probe checked back in with mission managers, sending a status beacon tone on January the 5th. The spacecraft is now transmitting science data from the encounter, including the properties, structure and behaviour of the solar wind. We'll give you more details when they come to hand. This is Space Time. <laughs> And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists have now confirmed that 2023 was indeed the hottest year ever recorded on planet Earth. 
The findings by the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service, which are based on both ground and satellite readings, show that the planet's average temperature in 2023 was 1.48 degrees Celsius warmer than the average for the 1850 to 1900 pre-industrial period. As well as being the planet's hottest recorded year by a substantial margin, the new readings also suggest that last year would have been the planet's warmest year in at least the last 100,000 years. The findings are based on global temperature records going back to 1850, and they're then checked against paleoclimatic data records from sources such as tree rings and ice core air bubbles. 2023 was also the first year in which every day was more than a degree Celsius hotter than pre-industrial levels, with two days, both in November, being two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. Last year was also 0.17 degrees hotter than 2016, which was the previous hottest year on record. Meteorologists say that while the arrival of an El Nino weather pattern has worsened the situation, Global warming, caused by the use of fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases, remains the primary cause behind the temperature increase. And emissions of carbon dioxide, the most significant greenhouse gas, remain stubbornly high. For example, last year the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rose to its highest ever recorded level of 419 parts per million. The World Meteorological Organization says China remains the world's biggest carbon dioxide polluter, producing almost a third of the total global output, amounting to more than 10.1 million tonnes annually. A team of researchers working for a company that's designed a new cancer testing regime claim that a sex-specific panel of just 10 proteins can pick up 18 different early-stage cancers, representing all the major organs of the human body. A report in the British Medical Journal claims the team whittled down a list of some 3,000 blood plasma proteins down to the final list of 10, which they say are expressed differently among the plasma of cancer patients and healthy people. The authors say they were able to identify 93% of stage 1 cancers among men in the sample group of 440 and 84% of women. An attached editorial to the study says that while there are still several problems in the test that need to be addressed before it can be deployed to the general population, this new method may be a good means of improving current issues related to sex-specific detection tests. A new study may have finally solved the mystery disappearance of the largest of the great apes from Asia. A report in the journal Nature focused on the extinction of the largest ever primate, Gigantopithecus blackie, which went extinct at a time when other Asian great apes were thriving. The new evidence, uncovered by a team of Australian, American and Chinese scientists, found that the largest primate to ever walk on the Earth went extinct between 295,000 and 215,000 years ago simply because they were unable to adapt their food preferences and behaviours and because they were vulnerable to the changing climates which eventually sealed their fate. Measurements of the fossilised teeth have allowed paleontologists to estimate Gigantopithecus' height at around 3 metres, that's 9.8 feet, with a mass of around 200 to 300 kilograms. Back in the 1950s, Bigfoot enthusiasts began to hypothesise that stories of Yeti, Yowies and Sasquatch were actually descriptions of encounters with relic populations of Gigantopithecus that had somehow survived in isolation from the changing world around them. But the most obvious problem with the Gigantopithecus Bigfoot connection theory is the simple fact that no scientific evidence supporting Bigfoot has ever been found. A recent letter signed by more than 100 distinguished scientists has sought to discredit integrated information theory, labelling the leading hypothesis of consciousness as nothing more than pseudoscience. However, as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out, no hypothesis of consciousness is currently empirically testable. So, strictly speaking, no such idea is scientific. It is a great debate and it actually has, it sounds a bit esoteric, but it actually has broader implications. Now, I have to preface this with saying I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a practicing philosopher, purely amateur, and I'm not necessarily an expert on consciousness. But looking at this, there is a debate right now about different ways of measuring and explaining what consciousness is. Generally speaking, sort of the view is that consciousness is how you are aware of the world around you, of your role in it, 
understand what's happening to you, etc. Now, consciousness, this idea has bigger implications beyond just an esoteric one of how the brain works. It has implications for legal issues and all sorts of things. You imagine like fetal consciousness of a, a fetus of a baby before born. Does it have consciousness? That has an implication for abortions and medical treatments of various sorts. Do animals have consciousness? And that has uh, implication for everything from laboratory testing to actually eating and using animals. Um, do plants have consciousness? And that's been suggested too. That, yeah, should you be cutting down pr- plants? Do they scream when you sort of uh, pull them out of the ground? Well, we've proven um, that litter screams when you cut it up. That's right. Do they? Yeah. Oh, yes, they do, yes. But uh, whether that's consciousness or just a chemical reaction, an automatic right. chemical reaction. Yeah. Okay. Even as far as suggesting that the universe has consciousness, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to um, do that. But basically, consciousness comes down to two different aspects. There's the physical one, which can be measured by neurological measurements, etc., sticking things to your head and measuring electrical impulses, that sort of stuff, which is pretty straightforward. And then there's the subjective measurements of consciousness, which is how people suggest what they have seen in the sort of witnessing of activities etc now it's a very broad area isn't it are we talking about simple chemical reactions or are we talking about i guess sentience because the line is very blurred between them that's right and, and that, that's why it's a bit of a contentious issue and it is as much a philosophical issue as it is a scientific one but anyway the argument right now is about one particular theory of assessing and explaining consciousness and it's called integrated information theory which is pretty dull and broad iit which is suggesting that the subjective and objective measurements are measuring the same thing, that they are the same and they're just different ways of looking at it. I mean, the the sceptics would know that there is a difference between reality and how people perceive it, that we know that witness testimony is is going to be very dodgy, especially over a period of time. We know that things like neurological testing through things like polygraph machines, which is the lie detectors, are almost useless uh, and are certainly not recognised in most courts because they're only measuring stress rather than truth and that not necessarily stress is not necessarily a great indicator of truth. So anyway, there's this debate about integrated information theory with a, a letter that was written by 120-odd scientists recently, presumably practising neurologists or philosophers or whatever, who are saying it's pseudoscience. And the response from at least one person who was who has studied this says you can't say, you can't highlight that one as being pseudoscience because all the theories are pseudoscience, which is perhaps not what the people who are promoting consciousness theory wanted to hear, but there's a range of different theories. There's the one called Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, and there's another one called the Higher Order Thought Theory, which is higher order thought, which is hot, so it's a hot theory. And there's basically what you call substitution agreements, which is the way that uh, people identify problems and that you know, inferences about consciousness as the experimenter, does the experimenter play a role, and all sorts of different things. Anyway, it is a complex area, but it does have implications in the, in the real world, as we've, as we've said. Is AI a form of consciousness? Well, that's exactly right. That's where it comes to. That's where you get into those big areas, and suddenly we get back to the, the three laws of robotics, which is obviously an AI issue. Isaac Asimov's three laws that robots have to obey you, robots have to protect you, and robots can't do anything that will hurt you. I usually power down when they come up. <laughs> and so, you know, very serious implications. I mean, imagine coma patients. How conscious are they, and what do you do? Stem cell research, is, is that a consciousness issue? Organoid testing, as they call it, which is often just bits of the brain yeah. put in the Petri dish, and you, you zap it or something. And it reacts what to that, yes. Yes, so, I mean, yeah, frog legs, etc. Um, well, are they, they conscious? They did an experiment with pig brains recently where they were able to get reactions which rendered the test questionable and, in fact, uh, it's been now banned because there was an issue about whether or not those brains had become conscious and had achieved sentience again. Yes, it, it, it is. I mean, it, you can take it down to the extreme and say everything is conscious uh, and, therefore, can you do anything to anything without impinging on its consciousness rights? That's when you get into very interesting philosophical areas and very sort of does it help you, does it go anywhere, is it, is it uh, applicable? Is it useful? And perhaps not. And anyway, these people are arguing about the methods that are being suggested, the theories of consciousness, what it is, how it can be assessed, etc., are pseudoscience. Quite possibly we'll never understand consciousness. We can, might be able to duplicate it with AI, etc. But consciousness will also involve sort of uh, ethical decision-making, all sorts of uh, appreciation of other people's rights, civil rights, all those sort of aspects should be coming into consciousness. Your own rights, primary amongst that. Can an AI do that? I don't know. Can you program in ethics, three laws of robotics, etc.? And therefore this argument, which is, sounds a bit esoteric and certainly complex. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's 
the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.